It being very close to 2 p.m., we will proceed to questions without notice. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Indeed, Senator Mackenzie is not here. Senator Wong. I'm not sure where any of the. Oh, Senator Birmingham and Senator McKenzie are here. We will ask that question time proceed for a few minutes further to reflect the delay. Senator McAllister, I will ask you to please repeat the question. Just hold for a moment while Senator McKenzie. Order. Senator McAllister, please start your question again. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Liberal Senator Alex Antic has said that net zero by 2050 was an absolute folly and that, and I quote, there is no way to achieve net zero without costing us jobs, without winding back our economy. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Senator Antic? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank the Chamber for um, a few minutes to catch my breath. Uh, but thank you also, Senator McAllister, for your question. I think the National Party has been very, very clear on the only thing that is exercising our mind Order. Uh, this week, and in fact the only thing that's exercised our party room for the last 14 years, this place has had this debate, and that is actually the impact of our country's climate policy decisions on rural and regional Australians, the people that live there, the poorest people in our nation live out in rural and regional Australia. They Order. live out in rural and regional Order. Australia. And when the Senator electricity is. prices go through the roof, they are the ones that feel the impact. The people that the transport workers who drive our food and fibre up and down the highways and byways of this nation, they will Senator be the ones is. that were slugged by former Labor government's uh, follies in this area. And it was Senator only one McAllister. political party that stood in the way. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McAllister. President, uh, my point of order is direct relevance. The question went to a quote that was provided by Senator Antic and whether or not uh, the Deputy Prime Minister agreed with that. Senator McKenzie has not really touched that question and I'd like her to answer it. As Sen Sen Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. As Senator McAllister, you know well, I cannot direct the minister how to answer the question. The question had a long preamble, including a quote. It, Senator Wong. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I recognise this is your first question time, and there will, it will take. Senator Wong, what is your point of order? Not reflecting on the president. Senator Wong, what is your point of order? Uh, we disagree with your ruling, Mr. President, and we would ask you, we would ask you, to reconsider a suggestion that there was a very long preamble as the basis of of your ruling. There so was. I'd ask you to read the Hansard. I, take a I haven't finished, if I may, Mr President. I haven't finished my submission. Senator Wong, please Thank you, continue. Mr President. I appreciate it. it. Senator Wong, please continue. Thank you. I was just waiting to see if there was something more you wish me to address. I would ask you to reconsider so your ruling so early to rule out an issue of direct relevance on the basis of a very long preamble. It was not a very long preamble, and I reiterate the opposition's point of order as to direct relevance. The minister has not even got close to Senator Antic's quote. Senator Wong, you did not actually wait, me to com wait for me to complete my ruling. Uh, I said there was a long preamble in the form of a quote, if you had allowed me to finish, that contained a, uh, a particular assertion. I believe the minister was 
being directly relevant to matters contained in the question. Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, as for Liberal Party senators and MPs, their contributions to this public debate, Senator Antic being one of them, I have no comment to make. I am absolutely prepared to stand by the Deputy Prime Minister's uh, public commentary and, in fact, the National Party's public commentary around the debate before the public at this time. And it is our whole sole focus as the representatives of the 30 per cent of Australians who don't live in capital cities, our miners, our manufacturers, our farmers, our regional capitals, to make sure their interests are served in this place and this debate. That is all we're interested in. That is the only question before us as a party, and that is the thing we are taking very, very seriously. Senator McAllister, you have a supplementary question? Yes, thanks, Mr President. Uh, Mr Antic has declared, and I quote, from a personal point of view, I certainly don't have any appetite for net zero. Does the Deputy Prime Minister think it is reasonable for Mr Morrison to ask the Nationals to sign up to net zero by 2050 when, after eight long years in government, members of his own party room aren't signed up? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Again, I'm not going to reflect on Senator Antic's uh, commentary. Someone else in this place can. What we are actually focused on as the National Party is absolutely ensuring that every single policy that our government prosecutes and puts before the people has rural and regional Australia's best interest at its very, very centre. And that is absolutely the thing. We are not ashamed to be standing up and saying, hold the horses, let's not gallop off to Glasgow, let's make sure that what we are considering as a government has actually come, gone through the prism of how it will affect the poorest in this country, the most high energy intensive industries in this country. And you know what? If it wasn't for us, no one else would be raising this. You all would have signed up in a heartbeat, and the only one standing up Minister, for the regions Minister, is the National please Party. Please resume your seat, Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr. President. With two weeks to go until the COP26 conference in Glasgow, this morning Mr. Joyce refused to rule out sending Mr. Morrison to Glasgow empty-handed and without a climate deal. After eight years. Three Prime Ministers and 21 energy policies. Will the Deputy Prime Minister agree to the Liberal plan on net zero emissions by 2050 before Mr Morrison steps on the plane? Minister Mackenzie. Well, one, one thing that all Order, National Party Senator MPs, uh, senators, ministers and, and the leadership group more broadly have made very, very clear it is that our party room will be the determinant of what our party room does. Uh, I won't actually be answering a question from the Labor Party in this place and surpassing the supremacy of the party room in determining my actions and the actions of our ministers and our party room more broadly. I think, though, what the rural and regional Australians actually need to understand is the biggest risk to their in industries, to their jobs, to their Order, children's Senator future Reyes. is an Albanese Bant government that has no plan, never has, and it's why on this question they do not trust you, they do not trust them. And so for as long as you two are in partnership, you can forget Order. the working class of this country Order. backing you at any election. Senator Molan, you have the call, and may I say it is great to see you back, Senator Molan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Order. Th thank you, Mr President, it, it, and it's just great to be back, I've got to say. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. With Australians responding magnificently to the call to get vaccinated against COVID-19 so we can safely return to normal life, can the minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and National Government is supporting our safe reopening and economic recovery from the pandemic? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Birmingham. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I too would like to warmly welcome back Senator Molan. It is wonderful to see him back in this chamber and indeed to see him looking so well. And congratulations on your battle, Jim. Mr. President, uh, indeed, Australians have been responding, as Senator Molan said, magnificently to the call to get vaccinated. More than 32.6 million vaccines have been administered across Australia. Some 84.8 per cent of those over the age of 16 have received their first dose of a vaccine, and 68.3 per cent across the nation have received their second dose being fully vaccinated. Mr President, this comes when Australia's comparison in terms of the saving of lives across the rest of the world remains an incredibly strong one. We indeed remain the nation amongst the 38 OECD countries to have the second lowest incidence of COVID cases per capita. We're in the nation where we have seen far fewer deaths. In fact, if you look at the UK or the USA, they have seen some 40 times the number of deaths per capita than have occurred in Australia from COVID-19. And by avoiding the OECD averages in terms of COVID-19 deaths, we've seen some 30,000 plus Australian lives saved. And also the time indeed, Mr President, for these millions of Australians, the vast majority of Australians now, to turn out and to get vaccinated, enabling us to see those states who have been battling lockdowns, such as Victoria, New South Wales and here in the ACT, begin the steps of reopening, and other states begin the steps of looking at how they transition to the next stages of a more vaccinated population. And can I welcome, Mr President, the news just prior to question time from the Queensland government, indicating that as those vaccination targets set out in the national plan our Prime Minister released, informed by the Doherty Institute modelling, will see Queensland open its borders at those 70 and 80 per cent thresholds. That is welcome news and sign of the progress that is being achieved. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr President. Despite the recent challenges of the Delta outbreak, how does Australia's economic and health performance compare internationally? Minister. Well, Mr President, Australia is one of the few countries in the world that, after the COVID-19 recession of last year, saw our economy grow back to be larger than it was prior to the pandemic starting. And whilst the Delta strain and the lockdowns across parts of the eastern states have caused an impact, on the whole, our labour market remains strong. Despite the havoc of the Delta variant, indeed the outlook for the Australian economy is incredibly strong. This was reaffirmed last week by one of the three major global credit rating agencies, Fitch, who not only reaffirmed Australia's AAA credit rating, but indeed upgraded our outlook. They had previously indicated that Australia was on the negative watch list. They've removed Australia from that, reaffirming the AAA credit rating, removing that negative watch list and indeed pointing to the strength of the Australian economy, to their confidence in terms of the jobs rebound that we've seen before in coming out of COVID lockdowns and that we will see again. Australia stands tall in the world for saving both lives and livelihoods, and that Minister, is something that we should all be very grateful for. The time the answer has for. expired. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what further measures will help to ensure confidence in our economic recovery and secure Australia's reopening in a safe and responsible way? Minister. Mr President, what we'll see is that uh, the continued opening up in accordance with the national plan that is happening across New South Wales, that we're now seeing Victoria take steps and the ACT take steps to follow, will give that confidence. The encouragement of seeing greater freedom in terms of international movements to come will enhance business confidence. The news from Queensland today will be one to enhance business confidence and I hope will be looked at by other state and territory premiers and chief ministers in relation to decisions aligned with the national plan. Because what we've been able to achieve as a country is not just saving lives, but providing the scientific framework for decisions to be made. The scientific framework of the Doherty Institute modelling demonstrating that at 70 per cent fully vaccination rates and 80 per cent fully vaccination rates, we can not only take the steps to reopen, but do so while keeping Australians safe do so in ways that enable us to manage COVID-19 more analogous to the flu and create an environment of confidence Minister, for Australian businesses and confidence expired. for Australia. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Liberal Senator Andrew Bragg has said, and I quote, 
It is quite clear that we should be looking to commit to net zero. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Senator Bragg? Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much for your question, Senator Ayres. Uh, I've made it very, very clear that we as a party room are considering the question of committing to net zero by 2050. What are the implications for rural and regional Australia? And Labor senator after Labor senator is going to quote me Liberal Party senators. Well, they don't sit in my party room. They don't sit in my party room. The people who are actually considering this question are National Party senators and MPs uh, who have made it very, very clear, whether it's uh, Anne Webster, who said we're not signing up to a blank cheque a couple of months ago, whether it's Matt Canavan, you can probably catch him uh, this evening on Sky, uh, often has made his views very, very clear on this, this issue. Uh, Senator Perrin Davey uh, on Chris Kenny made it very, very clear about our agriculturalists and our farmers who paid the price of our Kyoto uh, targets. So whilst Order, it may not resonate, it may not resonate to Senator you Watt. because you don't live where we live, you don't serve the people we serve, and out of sight is out of mind for the major parties in this building. And so it is the National Party who once again who once again stands before a policy, if not implemented appropriately, will severely impact rural and regional Australia, will severely impact mining, agriculture um, and manufacturing. Order. And we need to make sure we need to make sure we've assessed the plan that's been put to us to understand the implications uh, and to proceed in a calm and reasonable manner. Uh, with the Liberal Party on Senator a pathway McKenzie, forward. Senator McKenzie, your time has expired. Senator Ayres, you have a supplementary. Thank you. Liberal MP Jason Felinski has said, and I quote, economic benefits for Australia in signing up to net zero by 2050 are overwhelming and can't be understated. If Mr Felinski is correct, why have the Nationals still refused to sign up to net zero by 2050? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I think, um, again, for 100 years, rural and regional Australians have been sending National Party and, before us, Country Party MPs to Canberra to do one thing, uh, and one thing only, to stand up for the interests of rural and regional Australia and our industries. Senator and all we are doing is our job. We are doing our job. So we have uh, seen seen uh, a pathway to net zero that's been put to us and our party room is carefully considering that. That is what our constituents expect of us. Uh, that is actually a sensible and rational thing to do. Uh, we are actually two parties of government. The most successful coalition uh, has been maintained in this country for 75 years and have we delivered not just for the regions but for the whole country. And we are just Senator doing Senator McKenzie, our... time for the answer has expired. Senator Ayres, a second supplement. Liberal MP Trent Zimmerman has said net zero by 2050 is the right thing to do. Does this minister agree, agree with Mr Zimmerman that net zero by 2050 is the right thing to do? And if not, why not? No. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, I'm happy to table my opinion pieces of recent times on this issue of why I think it is um, uh, we need to adopt a cautious approach. We need to make sure we're doing the right thing by our people, because if we're not standing up for those with the lowest median income in the country, which is actually national party seats, uh, then we Order. actually aren't doing our jobs. And so if it's such a good Senator idea, Ayers. if it's such a good idea, what happened, uh, you know, what happened under Rudd and Gillard? What, what, what happened? When you had the chance to do the miracle dream team deal between the Greens and Labor, you walked away from it and you never really assessed what happened to the regions. If I asked you today what is the impact of Anthony Albanese's climate change policy on rural and regional Australia, what would you say? You'd have no idea, Order. no idea because
because you have no plan. Senator McKenzie. I will order. I will just remind the chamber that we should address those from the other place by their correct titles, even if they are former representatives. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and congratulations on your election. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister explain the importance of the AUKUS announcement and how the partnership will contribute to security and stability in the Indo-Pacific? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Abetz, uh, for your question, because AUKUS is a significant and historic enhancement of Australia's cooperation with the United Kingdom and the United States to promote both security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific in line with our shared values. This is a task on which we've worked together for more than 70 years, but today we face a growing set of challenges in our region. Military modernisation is occurring in our region at an increasing rate, and capabilities are advancing rapidly with ever-expanding reach. To meet these challenges and to help deliver the security and stability our region needs, we are taking our partnership to a new level. Building on our three nations' long-standing bilateral ties, the AUKUS partnership will provide a foundation for deepening cooperation on a range of emerging security and defence capabilities. As announced, the first initiative is the acquisition for the Royal Australian Navy of a nuclear-powered submarine fleet, leveraging decades of experience from both the United Kingdom and the United States. As a three-ocean nation, it is necessary for Australia to have access to the most capable submarine technology available. However, beyond that, the initiative will be wide cooperation in the most critical areas of innovation that will shape the 21st century, including cyber capabilities, artificial intelligence, quantum technologies and additional undersea capabilities. Through AUKUS, we will foster deeper integration of security and defence-related science, technology, industrial bases and supply chains. AUKUS is a partnership where our technology, our scientists, our industry and our defence forces will work together more closely than ever before to deliver a safer and more secure Indo-Pacific that ultimately benefits all nations. Senator Abetz, you have a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that detail. I further ask the minister to outline the ways in which AUKUS complements our existing network of partnerships. Minister. Working with partners is central to shaping our region uh, for Australia's foreign policy. AUKUS will complement our network of partnerships with ASEAN, with the Pacific, with our European partners, as well as with the growing Quad. It is a partnership that seeks to engage, not to exclude. We look for opportunities to enable and empower, rather than control or coerce. Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States are committed to strengthening our partnership with ASEAN and to deepening collaboration with our partners in Europe, including on the European Union's new Indo-Pacific strategy. We understand and have said clearly that we understand France's disappointment that we are not proceeding with the attack class program. We place great value on our relationship with France and we look forward to continuing to work with France on our many shared interests, including in the Indo-Pacific. Senator Abetz. In the context of the historic AUKUS agreement, can the minister advise the Senate of Australia's nuclear non-proliferation commitments? Minister. Again, I thank Senator Abetz for his question. Australia's commitment to nuclear weapons non-proliferation is unchanged. We are embarking on a nuclear propulsion program. Australia has clearly, explicitly stated that we will not acquire nuclear weapons. Australia has the strongest non-proliferation and safeguard standards and one of the best nuclear non-proliferation reputations in the world. For the fifth time in succession, Australia has ranked first globally on the Nuclear Threat Initiative's 2020 Nuclear Security Index. We ranked first for measures against the theft of nuclear material amongst 24 states and first out of 47 states for measures to prevent the sabotage of nuclear facilities. We will adhere to the highest standards of safeguards, transparency, verification and accountancy. We are committed to fulfilling our obligations as a non-nuclear weapons state 
and to meeting Minister, our non-proliferation obligations, the time such as the has South Pacific nuclear. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Foreign Minister. The countries going to the climate summit in Glasgow that have significantly increased their 2030 targets in this critical de decade are the US, the UK, the EU, Canada, South Africa, Norway, South Korea, Japan, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Kenya, the United Arab Emirates, and many others. Australia and Russia have not increased our ambition. Will you, as Foreign Minister, allow the National Party to throw this country's global reputation in the bin? Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Waters, for your question. And uh, to be very clear, and you and I have discussed this before in this uh, chamber, and I've made it pretty clear what the government's commitment is. I absolutely reject the uh, last part of your question, quite frankly. Because it really is important to note, Senator Waters, that Australia's emissions are at their lowest levels since records began in 1990. That emissions in 2020 were more than 20 per cent lower than in 2005, which of course is the baseline for the Paris Agreement. That Australia, since 2005, has reduced, achieved reduction in our emissions faster than Canada than Japan, than New Zealand and the United States. We're on track to beat our 2030 Paris target of reducing emissions by 26 to 28 per cent. On a, on a per person basis, that's a reduction of 48 to 49 per cent on 2005 levels. That is more than either France or Germany or Canada or New Zealand or Japan are expected to achieve. And in 2020 alone, Australia deployed more renewable energy than in the six years of the previous Labor government, but I don't hear that welcomed by those at the end of the chamber. I don't hear any commentary in relation to that. In fact, we are building wind and solar around three times faster than Europe or than the United States on a per-person basis. We've got the world's highest uptake of rooftop solar with one in four homes with rooftop solar panels. Our government is building Snowy 2.0, one of the largest pumped hydro projects in the Southern Hemisphere, the Tasma and Tasmania's Battery of the Nation, and an interconnector. I don't hear much about that from that end of the chamber either. Enough clean energy to be stored to power around a million homes. We're also investing in transmission projects to support our record levels of renewables to continue to deliver affordable, reliable energy. That's a record, Mr President, that this country will take to Glasgow. Senator Waters, you have a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Will the government go to Glasgow and do what the science requires for a safe climate and triple our targets for 2030? Or will you confirm reports of Minister Taylor's party room briefings that the government will not increase their 2030 targets? Minister. Thank you very much, and I thank Senator Waters for her question. I'm not going to comment on party room deliberations, uh, and uh, nor, nor I would have thought would uh, were those at the end of the chamber. But, Mr. President, what we have said we will take to Glasgow, and what we have said we will commit to, is being worked through by the government in terms of the discussions that many have commented on in recent days. But as I made clear in the answer to the previous question, many countries in the OECD can't claim Australia's achievements. I know you want to ignore achievements. I know they're an inconvenient truth for those of you at the end of the chamber. But, Mr President, and uh, through you to Senator Waters, what Australia will take will be to deliver a long-term emissions reduction strategy, one that we will release ahead of COP. COP26, but it's an economic strategy that will be underpinned by delivering affordable and reliable energy in a way that positions Australia to be successful uh, in lowering and ultimately net in a lowered and ultimately net zero emissions global economy of Minister, the future. Your time has expired. Senator Waters, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. The International Energy Agency has said that to reach net zero, not one single coal, oil or gas infrastructure project can be built. How can you go to Glasgow ignoring 2030 and pledging net zero by 2050 when Australia has 72 new major coal projects and 44 major gas projects planned in the coming years? Minister. 
Thank you. And I know those at the end of the chamber want to ignore all of the achievements that I've spoken about. But let's be very clear about what we will be able to focus on and what we can focus on as a nation, importantly, because we can develop, notwithstanding the intransigent and the small-minded approach of those at the end of the chamber, we can develop practical, scalable, technological solutions that will enable Australia to reach net zero while partnering with other countries to decarbonise and grow our economies. I know you don't care what the developing world can afford, Order, but we do. We do. We have a priority on supporting Senator technology Pratt. access of the developing world, low emissions technology, low cost. That is our focus, and that's what we're delivering. Senator Ayers. Yeah. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Mr Morrison has previously claimed electric vehicles would end the weekend and claimed emissions reduction targets would wreck the economy. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with those views? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I really thank you uh, for another hit out and another chance to respond on behalf of rural and regional Australia. People are berating the nationals right now. You can't pick up a newspaper in this country without saying, you know what, the Nats Senator are the last man and woman. Senator please resume your seat. Senator Wong, you have a point of order. Thank you, Mr President. Direct relevance. This is a question about whether or not the Deputy Prime Minister, whom the Minister represents, agrees with the statement the Prime Minister has made. I would ask you to draw the Minister to the question. Well, uh, on the point of order. 16 seconds that the minister has had uh, to respond. And the minister responding uh, as the minister representing the deputy prime minister, who is also the leader of the National Party. A series of questions that are clearly related to National Party decisions and National Party deliberations and discussions. The minister was clearly on a trajectory of talking about those National Party decisions, those National Party discussions, and in doing so, obviously addressing the broader issues that are raised. I think it is certainly very premature and probably uh, erroneous for the Leader of the Opposition to suggest that the Minister is at any point yet not being relevant. I, I was going to make the point that uh, the Minister had only been addressing the question for around 16 seconds. Uh, I, you have had the opportunity, Senator Wong, to bring the Minister's attention to the question. However, Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Well, thank you very much. Um, and in, in the, within the first 20 seconds, I shall address um, the sacrosanct nature of weekends to rural and regional Australians and the fact that we like Order. to. Honestly, honestly. Order. Rural and regional Australia, and indeed the broader, broader Australian public, are very thankful for the National Party. We, we, I know, you know, there's no. Friends for the National Party at the moment this week. Not a friend in the country. The peak bodies have deserted us. You know, Order. not a friend internationally. But you know what? If it wasn't for the National Party, our country would have a carbon tax right now. We'd have the Labor Party's carbon tax. And you know what our country under a Liberal National Government has been able to achieve since we came to, to government without a carbon tax? A 20 per cent decrease in emissions. A 20 per cent decrease in our emissions. You don't want to hear that, do you? 20 per cent decrease in our emissions whilst increasing our mineral exports, whilst increasing jobs in agriculture. So for you to argue that the only way back then for us to actually lower emissions in this country was to tax us was wrong. And you admit it now because it's your own policy. It is the Labor Party's policy not to instigate a carbon tax. So you need to be saying thank Minister, you to the National Minister, Party for saving Minister, you from yourselves. Minister, please resume your seat. Minister, I would ask you when I call you to resume your seat. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. We've given the minister a good go on relevance. It was a simple question about whether the Deputy Prime Minister agrees with opinions expressed by the Prime Minister. We haven't had an answer remotely close to that, and I'd ask you to bring the minister to order. Minister, uh, Senator Watt, you have had a chance to remind the Minister of the question. Minister, you have the call. Well, I, I think that the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister 
As I alluded to in an earlier answer, the coalition between the Liberal and the National Party has been the most successful political partnership this country has ever seen. It has delivered more, kept us more secure for the 75 years it's been in place, and long may it continue. Please resume your seat. Senator Green. Uh, thank you. Mr Morrison has previously described renewable energy targets as nuts. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with this view? Minister. Well, good question, Senator Betts. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that supplementary, supplementary question. It is rural and regional Australians and the MPs that represent them that actually see renewable projects in their backyard. Yep. We're the ones that have the wind farms. We're the ones that have the solar farms. And it is true that those and the hydropower stations, obviously in areas with a lot of water, uh, Senator Colbeck, like Tasmania. So we know very well the benefits that renewable projects Minister. bring to our communities. Minister. Sorry? Senator Watt. Again on relevance, Mr President. Very straightforward question whether the, Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister agrees with the view of the Prime Minister. We don't need a long Senator Watt. fairy tale Senator from the Minister. Watt. We just need an Get answer from the question. Point of order. On the point of order. Point of order, Mr. President, and uh, uh, and Senator Senator Watt there uh, seeks at the conclusion of his point of order to try to try to define how the minister should answer the question. It is clearly uh, not the role of the Senate uh, to define how a minister answers the question. Uh, the minister, from what I heard in the first ten seconds of her answer, I think, turned to uh, renewable projects uh, and renewable projects uh, and their impacts in regional Australia. Uh, the question indeed went to uh, renewable energy. Uh, well, there, uh, perhaps this just shows the Labor Senator Party thinks Watt. targets don't result in projects or action or change, Mr. Senator, President. That seems to be Senator, Senator Watt. I'm sorry, Senator, Mr. President. I apologise. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Apologise. Senator, Senator Birmingham has apologised. Senator Watt was interjecting. But the point. Senator Birmingham. The point being, Mr. President, Senator Watt clearly is, does not have a point of order in this Se case. Se okay. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Um, I believe the minister was being directly relevant. I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. Minister. I think it's pretty clear, if you look at the international evidence and the evidence here at home, that setting targets without plans to achieve them, or indeed the will to achieve them, are actually meaningless. So there are a lot of vacuous promises that are made, and the Greens uh, champion those promises in this place, uh, where countries overseas make very bold, ambitious targets and then fail to deliver Minister, on them at all. Minister. Senator Green, a second supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Last week, this minister said, and I quote, We've had all of these promises before, and I'll tell you what, the lived experience out there in the region isn't what was promised prior. If the government doesn't trust the government to deliver what it says it will, why should anyone else? Minister. Uh, thank you very much. For giving me the chance to clarify um, a comment I made in an opinion piece last week. So when we talk about the sell of Telstra, which both the Labor Party supported and the Liberal Party, who dealt with the poor communications, telecommunications, who couldn't, who couldn't call an AMBO, who couldn't Order. homeschool their kids? It was no one in Woolloomooloo and it was no one in any of your electorates. It was our electorates. On the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, the water policy in this country, it was our seats that pay the price. Out of sight, out of mind. And Order, I'm sorry, you don't like to Senator hear it, but it's true. And it is the Senator same. It is absolutely the same on this issue. We need to be assured on behalf of our people who sent us here on the impact on them, and that's Senator all McKenzie, we're doing. Please resume your seat. Senator Roberts. To President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Minister, I note that the Department of Statistics data for Australian fatalities has not been updated since June 30, 2021. 
At that time, deaths in Australia during 2021 were noticeably above the five-year moving average, even after allowing for the small number of COVID deaths. Minister, given that until June 30th this year, the Australian Bureau of Statistics posted that data six weeks after the period, why is the reporting of death data now 15 weeks after the period? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. Uh, Senator, I'll have to take that question on notice. Um, it may be, it may very well be that there's some delay in data being transmitted um, uh, between agencies. For example, we know in Victoria the uh, deaths due to COVID are uh, reported into their uh, public health emergency uh, system, the FEST system, which is where we use our death data and report our death data for, um, uh, for COVID deaths. Uh, that is then transmitted across to uh, their database for births, deaths and marriages. And there is sometimes a period of cleansing that needs required to actually certify whether or not a death has been uh, cause, um, caused by COVID, for example. So, Mr President, I will undertake to uh, get some information on that, but I suggest that that may be part of what's occurring because uh, there has been uh, some movement up and down in the reporting of deaths over uh, the last 18 months or so. Um, I've had some experience with that, in, particularly in relation to COVID as deaths are recertified. In fact, uh, in the last few days, I had the number of deaths from COVID in aged care reduced because somebody who was thought to have passed away actually hadn't. So there are some issues with respect to reporting and translating that information through the system. So I'm happy to take that on notice and report back to the chamber. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I did advise the minister's office of the subject of my question today and directed his office to my question on notice number 3970, asking for the same information. It's been outstanding for 12 weeks. Minister, how many people died in Australia in July, August and September of 2021? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and if you, uh, in the circumstance that you did advise my office, um, uh, I haven't been advised of that, so I can only apologise to you for not having the data with me right now, but I clearly don't have that information. Uh, and if there is a delay in the reporting, I suspect it has something to do with the uh, explanation I gave you in your primary question, but I am happy to chase that information up and come back to the chamber as soon as possible. Senator Roberts, a second supplementary. Minister, this information is critical to trust in vaccines and its omission raises serious doubts and serious questions. How is it possible that you don't know? What are you hiding? Senator, Senator Colbeck, Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I reject the assertion that the government or anyone is actually hiding anything? Um, I've uh, given to the chamber a quite plausible rationale for the fact that uh, there is, uh, a del are some delays in respect of the reporting of deaths in this country, there is no reason for us to um, make any um, to hide it all. And can I also uh, reject the assertion, Mr. President, that somehow the death data has any relationship or should have any relationship to uh, vaccines, Mr. President? The overwhelming data in this country right now indicates to us that vaccines work. Uh, we can see that in the data, we can see that in the circumstances in the general community right now, uh, and if anybody has any questions with respect to <laughs> the fact that vaccines work, just look at the data that's available right Minister, now. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President, and congratulations to you on your new role. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister... Order. Order. Senator Bragg. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government has supported Australians who have been unable to work during the COVID lockdown? 
the Minister for Emergency Man Management, Minister, uh, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you so much, Senator Order. Bragg, for the question and for your ongoing advocacy for Order. the people of New South Wales. Throughout this entire pandemic, our government has stood side by side with Australians and carefully monitored their needs to ensure that our uh, recovery remains on track. More than 65 per cent of the eligible population has done the right thing, rolled their sleeves up and is now fully vaccinated. But a few of the states are leading the way, and there is no doubt this is due to the fact that they have had to endure lengthy lockdowns that have meant millions of workers uh, have been unable to work or have had that, seen their hours significantly reduced. The Liberal and Nationals government has been there to support those Australians and have paid more than $11 Order. billion dollars to over 2 million people throughout uh, this period through the COVID disaster payment, a payment that was always intended to be temporary to ensure the financial viability of Australians while we slowed the spread of the virus and increased vaccination rates. A payment that has kept food on people's tables, kept fuel in the car, kept the heater on and removed financial stress at a time of such uncertainty. Without these payments, a lot of people wouldn't have made it through. As more and more Australians are getting their vaccination, states and territories have been able to safely ease restrictions and we're finally beginning to see the end of these lockdowns. This has meant that people have not only been able to get back to work, but get back to doing things they love and learning to adjust to living with the virus. This week, we've seen Victoria, the state with the longest lockdown city in the world, bring forward their plan to ease restrictions. And Canberra has one of the highest vaccinations in any, of any city across the globe, with over 99 per cent of their population having received their first dose. This means, as we transition back to normal life, there will be less need for the COVID-19 disaster payment. It served its purpose and will continue to do so until vaccination rates reach 80 per cent in states and territories. Senator Bragg, you have a supplementary President. question. Uh, New, South or, Wales has endured, New South Wales has endured a lengthy lockdown, and we are now seeing people back to work and getting back to a normal life. Can the minister update the Senate on what support has gone to New South Wales? Minister. Uh, thank you. A very, lockdown, a very long lockdown indeed, Senator Bragg, um, and it's good to see opening up. Over 100 days, in fact, and 100 days of limited to no income for some. And that's why we were there, supporting the people of New South Wales to be able to come out of lockdown in a strong economic position. The Liberal and Nationals government COVID disaster payment has provided more than $1.3 billion in financial support for those in New South Wales alone. They did the right thing. They stayed at home. They got vaccinated, reaching both 70 and 80 per cent milestones before any other state in the country. And they did this with the hope that at some point their life would return to normal. Well, Mr President, I'm so pleased to see that coming Order. to life, and I'm sure you are too, Senator Bragg. And our support has extended to businesses across the state. In partnership with the New South Wales Liberal National Government, we've seen more than 200,000 businesses receive nearly $6 billion through the Job Saver program. Our government will continue Senator to support the people of New South Wales as they transition out of this pandemic. Senator Bragg, a second thank, supplementary. Thank you very much. As we begin to see the safe relaxing of restrictions in our workforce opening back up, how will the government support Australians through the transition back to work? Minister. We know Order. that people want to just get back to normal. It's been an incredibly tough period for our country. They want to be able to travel without restrictions. They want to be reunited with loved ones, their friends, their colleagues in the workplace and to put this pandemic behind them. And this means when state and territories reach 80 per cent double vaccination rates, our support won't stop. It will wind down, though, over a period of two weeks, because the COVID disaster payment is just that. It's a disaster payment. It was never intended to be long term. Once phase B, C and D of the national plan are reached, we will no longer be in a state of disaster. We're not abandoning workers like those opposite have claimed, a claim that is completely unfounded given the continued Order. commitment throughout this pandemic Order. of the federal government to both individuals and business support payments. After the disaster payment has tapered down over a two-week period, we will continue to support Australians who have been unable to transition back to their usual employment through our existing strong safety support network Minister, uh, run through Services Minister, Australia. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. 
National Senator Matt Canavan has said Mr Morrison does not have that Mr Morrison does not have a plan for net zero but is instead relying on and I quote a prayer that hydrogen comes along and saves all these jobs does the deputy prime minister agree with senator canavan the minister representing the deputy prime minister senator mckenzie uh, thank you very much mr president what senator canavan is concerned about what the deputy prime minister is concerned about what the entire national party is concerned about is the impact of any uh, move towards net zero on regional jobs. It's that simple. Uh, we only wish that the Labor Party and the Greens could have a similar concern, because the reality is you actually have no plan to get to net zero by 2050. You actually have you walked away from your 2030 target at the 2019 election. You don't have a medium target. You don't Minister, have a plan to achieve. Minister, to Minister, Minister, please, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. On a point of order. Uh, point of order, Wong. direct relevance, uh, and there are there are long-standing precedents that a discussion of opposition policy is not directly relevant to a question about government policy. Uh, yeah, there is. Senator Mackenzie, um, I I will bring you back to the question that was asked, and I um, ask you to resume your answer. Senator Mackenzie, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, the Labor doesn't currently have a medium-term target nor a plan to get anywhere Sen near Senator, 250. Senator Mackenzie, I, I will bring you back to the question. Um, no, it's about Senator Canavan and the Deputy Prime Minister. And do they agree? And they agree. They agree on the need to protect regional jobs for not just the next three weeks, just, not just the next three months, but the next 30 years. They are absolutely agreed on that, as we all are in the National Party. The National Party has a broad, broad range of views on the substantive issue of climate change. That's no, there's no secret there. Uh, but what we are all united on is to ensure that any climate policy that this country agrees to does not disadvantage the regions, and we're taking our time to assess that and come to a position. But in this place, it isn't just talking about the Nats as much as I could do that all day and what our plans for the regions are. It is actually to put before the Australian people what the alternative is. And the fact is you don't have one. You have no idea how you're going to get to your plan of 250. Absolutely not. You want to join, you will have to form a government with these guys. And you know who's under attack if, if Labor and Greens get in power? The fishing industry the foresting industry, the live cattle expert, export industry, the mining Minister, industry, your time the gas industry, Minister, the coal Minister. industry. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Canavan has also said, and I quote, the Prime Minister might believe in miracles, but I don't think we should gamble people's jobs on a wing and a prayer. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Senator Canavan? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Well, I agree. I believe in miracles too. I do. So, um, you know, Order. we don't. We don't. Um, I guess on this, I think. I think when when you phrasing that um, particular quote you put to me, was it in context of the last election? That was actually the miracle win because Australians actually woke up, woke up to what a racket the policy positions being put before them by the Labor Party and Bill Shorten and his leadership group were, and the negative impact that they would have, not on the top end of town, on mums and dads out there right across regional Australia and the suburbs and the suburbs. And they rejected it wholeheartedly. So yeah, I believe in miracles. Absolutely. Senator Watt, a second supplementary question. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President. Given Senator Canavan also declared in a piece entitled Woke Net Zero Targets Will Weaken Us, and I quote, 
Net zero emissions is the public policy embodiment of corporate bullshit. Does the Deputy Prime Minister think Mr Morrison should still be confident he can wrangle a climate deal with the Nationals just two weeks from the COP26 conference in Glasgow? Minister. Um, I think, you know, if, it's good that you're actually reading Matt's articles. I suggest you also sign up to his YouTube channel. Um, you can usually find him on most Sky After Dark uh, commentators. If you're a fan of Matt Canavan, that's where you'll find him. You know what? Se through you, Mr President, Senator Watt, Senator Watt, we don't shy away from having 20 very proud rural and regional Australians in our party room yeah. who all have a view on a range of matters, and they are actually able to speak freely, not just in the party room, but outside of it. What we are committed to doing is actually making sure we keep you out of government. That's actually what the National Party and the Liberal Party want to see happen, is stopping the Labor Party whose policies would decimate Order. this country, Order. decimate the regions and our industries, because you don't Senator care. Pratt. That's why they don't Senator vote for Pratt. you. Senator Pratt. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President, and congratulations on your election earlier today. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is assisting women who are escaping domestic violence? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I too add my congratulations to your appointment to the auspicious role of being pres president of this amazing place. And can I also thank Senator Chandler for her question, um, you know, a question that is just so incredibly important to all Australians. It's about ending violence against women and their children. Sadly, we know that one in six women will actually experience violence at the hands of a partner from the age of 15. And it is an absolute blight on our society, and I can assure everybody in this chamber that this government is absolutely committed to doing something about it. We must aim to prevent violence before it happens, but unfortunately when it does happen we also need to be there to support women and their children to help them rebuild their lives. That's why today I was pleased to announce the Ending Violence um, Payment which is a $144.8 million initiative that was part of the $1.1 billion investment in women's safety during the budget. The payment aims to help 12,000 women. Uh, however, it is a demand-driven system uh, and payment uh, to make sure that we provide them with the necessary supports so that they are able to overcome the financial barriers of leaving violent relationships and, in doing so, alleviating one of the main reasons by women stay in violent relationships or potentially go back to violent relationships. The flagship investment will give women more security when they make that extraordinary brave decision to leave a violent relationship in all the forms of domestic family and sexual violence, including physical violence, coercive control and financial abuse. The payment, escaping violence payment is uh, up to $5,000 to help women rebuild their lives free of violence. $1,500 of this will be in cash to buy something perhaps as simple as buying the kids a new lunchbox. The other 3,500 can go towards things like paying for rental bonds, white goods, school fees, etc. It's not taxable, it's not reportable, and it doesn't impact on other, uh, other payments. And I look forward to continuing to update the Senate on this initiative. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain how the escaping violence payment responds to our growing understanding of the ways women experience violence? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, well, it is an extraordinarily important issue and one which we know that we must continue to address as we work towards developing the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. Since the first plan was implemented in 2010, our understanding of what violence is and how it manifests has certainly grown. New and emerging forms of domestic violence, things like coercive control, financial abuse, technology facilitated abuse, are absolutely insidious and make it near impossible in some circumstances for women to have the resources to gather them to make that decision to actually leave an abusive relationship. 
These barriers to leaving an abusive relationship are exactly what the escaping violence payment is directed at making sure we address. Importantly, as I said, the payment is, uh, is not means tested in the traditional sense. We want to make sure it's available to every woman, no matter where she comes from, because we know it's not uncommon for bank accounts to be frozen, credit cards to be cut off. It doesn't matter what size the house the Minister, woman comes from, no. she Minister, needs our support. The time for the answer has expired. Senator Chandler, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please advise the Senate how women can access the new escaping violence payment? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm really pleased uh, that as of tomorrow morning, um, Uniting Care Australia Consortium, who is, uh, is our preferred and selected partner, will start the two-year trial to support this program. Uniting Care has an extensive um, experience in supporting victim survivors of domestic family and sexual violence. And they also have a footprint that covers very, uh, a huge amount of Australia. The support that is being provided under this program will be tailored to meet the individual circumstances, and we will also be working through Uniting Care with state and territory um, governments to make sure that we have got a seamless support for women when they leave uh, a domestic violence uh, situation. Eligible applicants must be experiencing domestic violence and have, have changed living circumstances or may find themselves in changed living circumstances and be under financial stress. But uh, evidence can be included, but is not limited to making uh, things like domestic violence orders, um, referral from a, uh, a uh, Minister, domestic violence service the provider. Time for the question, the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. It is reported Mr. Morrison is preparing to fork out more than $20 billion to get the Nationals to support his net zero plan. How much taxpayer money is Mr Morrison willing to spend to buy a political fix? Minister for Finance. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Gallagher for her question, because, uh, because certainly what our government is quite proudly doing at present is preparing indeed the commitments and plans that the Prime Minister will take to the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. Those commitments and plans entail planning not just in relation to what the emissions reduction framework and commitments will look like, but indeed how we will protect the jobs of those communities across Australia who are facing change brought about by a changing international environment. How we will protect the jobs, how we will protect those communities, how we will ensure that they can have confidence that they will be supported through transition that is going to occur as a result of a changed global investment environment, of a changed environment in relation to many of our key export markets and commitments they're making. These are changes that are happening, and it sounds to me, from the tone of the question put by Senator Gallagher, that she's happy to leave those communities behind, to not care about those jobs, to think that if there is some investment in protecting those communities, in supporting them to take Order. advantage of the opportunities to come, that that should just be ignored. Well, those of us on this side, the Liberals and the Nationals on this side, we will certainly not leave regional Australia Order, behind. Senator we will McAllister. not leave regional communities behind. We will make sure that just as we invest to pursue lower emissions and to work towards net zero, that we equally invest to protect Australian communities, the regions that we have relied upon as a nation for so long for so many of our export activities, and to ensure that they have a bright future that they can seize the opportunities ahead, be they in new energy opportunities or be they other new opportunities that can be created. And indeed, for Senator Gallagher to come here and want to ask a question about wasting money, but I saw just yesterday she seemed to walk back from the $300 vaccine payments. Talk about a $6 billion waste Order. of money, paying people to do Order. something that Australians have thankfully already turned out Order. to do and turned out to do in their millions. Minister. Order. Order. Senator Gallagher, supplementary question. I do have a supplementary. Given it has been reported that one government MP has said, and I quote, there's going to be a giant National Party green rainbow across regional Australia with crocs full of pork at the bottom, is there any upper limit to how much taxpayer money Mr Morrison is willing to spend to buy a political deal? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I could just as equally ask, is there any place or point at which those opposite will acknowledge the importance of those regional jobs or those regional communities? Now, Mr. President, we are going through these discussions asking all the Order. right questions. 
On this side, we ask all the right questions. We don't make a commitment and then try to work out how to put the plan in place. We are in parallel working through the questions of how we deliver the commitments in relation to climate change, but do so in ways to support the regional communities and jobs of Australians. That's the responsible way to go about these sorts of policies, to do it in alignment, to do it together and to make sure that you can present plans that do provide that support and respect to Australians. It's unsurprising, given the question Senator Gallagher is asking, that indeed those opposite simply make the promise Order. without consideration for the consequences, make the promise without actually thinking about the plan. For them, they sort of jump out of the plane and then see whether they packed the parachute. Well, Mr President, we're Minister, making sure Minister, that we have everything Minister, answered in advance. Minister. Senator Gallagher, thank that's you, not Mr. helping. President. A second supplementary Sorry. question. Um, thank you. The Minister for Finance has said it's critical for the Morrison Joyce government to have, and I quote, a target and a plan. Will the Minister guarantee that any last minute political deal with the Nationals will meet the standard he himself has set? Minister. Well, yeah, it, it, indeed, Mr. President, as Senator Betts, I think, just alluded, I, I, I do agree with my own words. Um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to confirm that to, uh, to the Senate. And, uh, and, and, Mr. President, uh, that is precisely, if, uh, if the Senator had been listening to, I think, the previous two answers I'd given, what I have talked the Senate through the fact that we are working concurrently through the process in relation to targets and the process in relation to the plans to meet those targets, and not just the plans to meet the targets without consideration of the consequences of meeting the targets, but the plans to meet the targets whilst considering the consequences of that for different communities across Australia, not just Order. looking at it at a national level or a macro level, but drilling it down to consider the impacts across different states and territories, across different regions, across different industry Order. sectors, because that's how you do the job properly. That's how you take care of Australians. That's how you ensure that Australian regions, communities, states, families have the strongest possible future, which is what Minister. we wish to secure. And, Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. And whilst on my feet, I would also table for the Sorry. information of the Senate a revised ministry list. Apologies, I didn't do so at the start of question time, albeit there is no change to representational arrangements in this chamber. I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Senator Roberts. Good. I seek leave to correct the record of a statement I made in question time. Sorry. <laughs> is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. I just want to correct the record that um, I said to Senator Colbeck that, his, that my question on notice uh, 3970 has been outstanding for 12 weeks. That was correct, but I didn't. But I also said that my staff had tried to contact his office today. While that's correct, they didn't get through and did not follow up later. So Senator Sol Colbeck's staff was not advised of that question today. Thank you, Senator Robert. Senator Ayres. Madam Deputy President, Understanding Order 745A, and on behalf of Senators Wong, Gallagher, Watt and Kitching, I seek an explanation from the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why 71 questions placed on notice through the table office between 15 September 2020 and 12 September 2021 remain unanswered. I further seek an explanation on behalf of Senators Wong, Gallagher, Chisholm, Smith, Kitching, Keneally and myself as to why 61 estimates questions placed on notice through the Finance and Public Administration Committee for the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet remain unanswered. I note I've provided an itemised list uh, to the Minister's office earlier today. Minister. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Deputy President, uh, firstly, just in response to Senator Ayres, could, uh, could through you I ask uh, the new president just to consider uh, in relation to this standing order um, what has become an emerging practice of senators asking, not just in relation to questions uh, that may be unanswered that they have asked, but also seeking to do so in relation to other senators. Uh, I am uh, not sure, Deputy President, uh, that that is uh, truly 
in keeping with the letter of the standing order uh, and would, uh, would encourage uh, the president to, uh, to just take a look at that and to reflect upon it uh, following advice. Can I say in relation to response to questions that this government in this parliament has been more responsive to more questions than at any time in recent memory. That, Mr. That Deputy President, uh, through the course of this parliament, we have responded to some 4,313 parliamentary questions on notice. 4,313. That is almost as many questions on notice through the parliament, through this chamber, in the life of this parliament as in the two previous parliaments put together. Mr President, when it comes to Senate estimates questions on notice, we have responded since the 2019 election to 31,486 questions on notice. So, Mr President, I make the point, as I said, that in terms of parliamentary questions on notice, we have been more responsive to more questions than in either of the last couple of parliaments, and in fact, at the point where this parliament has done more, in, and this government has done more in responding to questions than the previous parliaments combined. And that in total, across parliamentary questions on notice and Senate estimates questions on notice, uh, we indeed uh, are now tracking, are now tracking uh, close to 36,000 questions that have been asked and answered uh, by the government during this time. And so the government well and truly lives up to the expectations of accountability. In fact, I think most people would be incredibly surprised to learn of that sheer volume of questions asked and answered and tabled and responded in this place. And that, Mr. President, uh, Deputy President, does not include the myriad uh, of other committees, including, for example, the uh, COVID Select Committee that was established, uh, which have posed many additional questions. Nor does it count, of course, the many, many hours spent in estimates in committee hearings or in this place answering questions that are not taken uh, on notice. Uh, so, uh, yes, Deputy President, I know there are a handful, in relative terms, a handful compared to the tens of thousands that have been answered uh, that remain outstanding. The government works through these things uh, as best we can uh, with the record volumes uh, of questions that we have continued to face, uh, and we have provided not just uh, handled a record number of questions, but provided record numbers of answers. And we will continue to work through uh, providing those record numbers of answers as uh, much as we, as we possibly can. Thank you, Minister. And I will respond to the question you asked. I have ruled on this before, and it is in order for a senator to uh, combine a, a number of unanswered questions from different senators in the one motion. <coughs> Uh, Senator Ez, are you seeking the call further? Yeah, I just moved to take note of the um, minister's response. Um, just make this point uh, gently uh, to the Senate that, uh, notwithstanding Senator Birmingham's pre-prepared response, the problem that this government has uh, with responding to questions, the questions on notice. The problem this government has indeed in responding to questions in the chamber is that the culture of secrecy, the, the, the entire lack of accountability, the commitment to avoiding transparency uh, is, the, is the characteristic that will define this government. It will leave no lasting legacy uh, when it's finally gone in policy terms or in terms of achievements, it will only leave a giant hole in public finances created in large part through its failure to deal effectively with the COVID-19 pandemic, the greatest public policy failure in Australian history. It, even its own supporters say it's the greatest public policy failure in Australian history. Uh, the lasting legacy that will be left, that will need to be swept aside, is the culture of secrecy and servility and complacency and lack of accountability that it has infected 
the upper echelons of Australia's public service with. That's why there's so much obstruction to questions being asked on notice. That's why we have 71 questions through the table office provided over just the space of a few days, treated with utter contempt by ministers uh, and by the leader of the government in the Senate. That's why 61 questions placed through the committee that I've got the honour to be the deputy chair of by Senators Wong and Gallagher, Chisholm, Smith, Kitchen, Keneally and myself. 71 questions unanswered. And the thing that's interesting about those questions is that they're all questions directed towards the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And we saw last week the culture of secrecy that surrounds that department when they became before the Legislation Committee of the Finance and Public Administration. <laughs> Mr Gaitchens, the Secretary of that department, the Prime Minister's friend appointed to become the Secretary, the most partisan departmental secretary in Australian political history. There is a relationship between being the most partisan secretary of that department uh, in Australian history and having the greatest public policy failure in Australian history because this government is all about the partisan okay. politics. It's all about the announcement it's never about the delivery in the interests of the Australian people, and we saw that because this bill that the government proposes to submit to the parliament at some point, if it can find some friends uh, for the COAG amendment bill, was the subject of scrutiny early last week. And Mr Gaitchens from the department refused to turn up. And that the effect of the bill would be to drop the black veil of secrecy, of cabinet confidentiality, over the deliberations of national cabinet. You see, there's a pattern here, a refusal to answer questions, a refusal to deal with questions on notice, an ever-creeping extension of opposition uh, and lifting the costs and pro providing every procedural barrier to freedom of information applications. Now, when the government and the department in particular got smashed in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal uh, through a decision of His Honour Justice White, which said that their pathetic attempt to define the National Cabinet as a subcommittee of cabinet could not be sustained. And the government's position was trashed in the Administrative Appeal Tribunal. It was utterly, utterly humiliating defeat. And so what is the response? Well, the department and the government draft a piece of legislation which is designed to say that the earth is flat, that the moon is made of cheese, that the National Cabinet is somehow a subcommittee of cabinet. Well, it has none of those features. This government, so desperate, so desperate to put the shroud of secrecy over the operations of government when there is no possible public interest in doing so. No possible public interest in doing so. And the government has so debased the notion of effective government accountability in this country has retreated so far from its own responsibilities to be open and accountable with the Australian people that this process of dealing with questions on notice by just pretending that they're not there should come as no surprise to anybody. Now that bill, the COAG bill, is entirely friendless. Not a single coalition senator stood up or moved a muscle for a whole day while that bill was torn apart by all of the legal experts, all of the witnesses, 
Anybody who had any interest in public accountability and transparency pulled that bill apart and not one Liberal senator moved a muscle. Do you know why, Madam Deputy President? Because they were ashamed. They were ashamed of the direction that Mr Morrison has taken this government in. They can't defend the position that Mr Morrison and Mr Gaitchens have taken around public accountability. And while they'll be in here thumping the table and shouting and hollering about, uh, about questions on notice and, and Minister Birmingham, Senator Birmingham will be in here with a pre-prepared response, they know that it's gone way too far, that the culture of secrecy and cover-up and acting in your own political partisan interest rather than in the public interest has entirely captured this government, has entirely reduced it uh, to a, a government that is disappearing so fast in terms of its capacity to act in the public interest, in terms of the place that it should hold in the Commonwealth, uh, that it's collapsing uh, under its own weight. Uh, thank you, Madam Mackin, Deputy President. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Um, I also rise. Uh, understanding Order uh, 74.5 uh, to seek an explanation from uh, the Minister representing the Prime Minister as to why question number 3985 has not been answered. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Deputy President. Uh, uh, Senator Patrick, uh, through the Chair. Um, I don't have specifics in relation to that question, Senator Patrick. Uh, I appreciate you asking about uh, one particular question, but I've not been able to, uh, to get um, a specific update. I draw your attention to the broader points that, uh, that I made, uh, albeit it was in relation to a much more general question from Senator Ayres before. Uh, I respect you asking about one particular question, and uh, I will follow that up uh, upon leaving the chamber. Um, just a moment, Senator Patrick, because I assumed you were speaking on the same matter, so I'll just dispose of the first matter and then I'll come to you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Ayres be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Patrick. Uh, I apologise, um, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, the, uh, so I, I seek to take note of the Minister's answer in, re in yep. response to uh, uh, my uh, query as to why the question hasn't been answered. And uh, look, I'm not in intending to cluster a whole range of questions. Uh, every question I put on notice, I read uh, the answer when it comes back. It's provided by my staff, and I read them and consider them. Um, this is an important question, and I'll uh, run through uh, uh, the question. It uh, really deals with two matters. One of them is the uh, fact, or both of them relate to costs uh, in relation to AAT matters, freedom of information matters, where the Commonwealth uh, challenged uh, uh, a, um, or, or, or sought to try and uphold what were later found to be erroneous and cavalier FOI decisions. One of them relates to the Hawkeye audit mm -hmm. conducted by the Auditor General in 2018 uh, and the fact that the Auditor was censored by the Attorney General who issued a Auditor General Act Section 37 certificate to censor information provided uh, to the Parliament. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Deputy President Britton Jones found that the Attorney General was just simply wrong in, uh, in issuing that, uh, that certificate. Uh, um, uh, that particular question, I've actually been I've actually asked it three or four times, the question as to what is, what's the cost associated with that? What's the cost associated to the taxpayer of the Commonwealth resisting, or the government resisting, the provision of, um, or, or, or the release of, of information which should have been made available in the public? The second one relates to the costs associated with the National Cabinet. So just, uh, the, you know, the question says, you know, what was the Australian uh, government's uh, solicitor's um, estimate when it was engaged as to what uh, those costs would be to the taxpayer. What were those costs and um, whether or not the matter or the invoices have been finalised? I actually have had an answer through the estimates process that the National Cabinet matter to date has cost $107,000 
$107,000 went to the AGS to try to defend that particular matter, and I'll come to uh, their performance in relation uh, to that. Um, it follows another FOI answer I got the other day relating to a matter on foot where the government spending has spent $250,000 opposing access to what effectively is one number. Uh, I wonder what the Hawkeye matter will cost. I've asked on several occasions, and uh, on several occasions the answers come back with there have been no, or the invoices haven't been finalised. I will be raising that with the AGS when I, uh, uh, when I uh, see them at estimates because, in actual fact, that particular matter is over a year old, so it's hard to believe that, they're, that they haven't properly invoiced that matter. Uh, I think the tally in, re in relation to the government opposing access under FOI to me must be coming up to a million dollars. I mean, that's shameful. A million dollars, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, that's a guess, but we know, uh, you know at least it's at least $350,000. I haven't added up, added up all the other wins that I've had and the costs associated with them. Maybe I should do that. Um, but this is real money, real money being used to oppose transparency. So just to go to the, the National Cabinet uh, decision, and I know Senator Ayres talked about this, obviously the history of that, uh, that particular matter was that uh, at, in the face of a pandemic, the Prime Minister called together uh, all of the First Ministers, all the Premiers and the uh, Territory Chiefs uh, to conduct a, a, a regular meeting, and no one has any objection to that. It's actually quite a sensible thing to do. The offensive thing that was done was that the Prime Minister, uh, in a, in, you know, consistent with his secrecy obsession, decided to, to, to um, pull uh, the eyes over the Australian public and suggest that it was a committee of the Cabinet. Uh, now, of course, Justice White he did examine this, and he examined it and found that the um, the, the, the National Cabinet wasn't even established by the Cabinet, the, sorry, the, the, you know, as a committee of, uh, of uh, the Federal Cabinet, wasn't even established by the Cabinet, it was actually established by COAG. Uh, Justice White found that uh, there's no co Cabinet solidarity. Justice White found that there's no collective responsibility in the National Cabinet. Justice White pointed out that uh, there is no um, one single parliament to whom the National Cabinet is responsible to. In fact, it's responsible to a whole range of different uh, parliaments and therefore can't be a cabinet. And along the way, uh, it's interesting, if people read the decision, they'll see that Justice White was quite frustrated with the approach of the Commonwealth in, um, uh, in the way in which it handled the matter, not putting primary evidence on the record. Um, his view on uh, evidence received from uh, Mr Gaitchens and Ms McGregor um, was that it couldn't be relied upon. And in actual fact, it was found that the uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet advanced some facts that turned out not to be facts. On affidavit, they swore certain facts that were not true. And uh, look, counsel for the uh, f for the uh, prime for the, for the secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet had to concede that during the proceedings that, in actual fact, they were wrong. And that disturbs me not just from the fact that uh, you know someone puts on an affidavit something that is not true, but it is the premier department in our government, Prime Minister and Cabinet. Everyone's supposed to look at Prime Minister and Cabinet and say they set the example and greatly disappointed in the way in which that particular matter was con conducted. And uh, you know, Senator Ayres is right. In response to that um, very solid judgment by Justice White, there's no room to manoeuvre in relation to that. You, there is no appeal. You can't appeal what he put in his judgment because it is legally correct. And uh, one of the astounding things uh, in the affidavit of um, uh, Mr Gaitchens to the tribunal at some stage was to say that uh, don't worry about all these judicial precedents on what uh, National Cabinet is because we're the authority on it. 
Now, it really bothers me that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet think that a word in a statute, i.e. a cabinet or a committee of the cabinet, gets defined by the Prime Minister and not a judicial officer. That's not how it works. Sure, in this place we can provide clarity, but if there's any question as to the meaning of a word in a statute, that is the clear purview, the clear um, decision-making place for the judiciary, not for uh, a uh, department. So, you know, very, very surprising that such a statement was advanced in the context of those proceedings. And in in response to the, uh, I think uh, Senator Ayres said the trashing of the argument of the Commonwealth. What have they done? They've introduced a new law. They've introduced a new law, so more costs associated with the taxpayer to try and keep um, matters which are not cabinet matters uh, secret. They've introduced no new laws which, again, as Senator Ayres said correctly, has no friends. I went to the committee hearing and found there were no friends of that bill other than the de Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Professor Twomey, um, uh, Mr Geoffrey Watson SC, whomever it was that appeared before that committee just rejected that, uh, that partic particular piece of proposed legislation. We've even got um, uh, uh, Senator Rennick committing to cross the floor on that one, and good on him for doing that, for standing up for what is right. Hopefully we'll see some other uh, uh, people who have some loyalty to the courts uh, do exactly the same thing if the government dares to even bring it into this place. Um, and then on the back of that, interestingly enough, uh, I spoke to Senator Gallagher the other, uh, the other day about whether or not uh, in the COVID committee where Prime Minister and Cabinet advanced a public interest immunity claim on the basis of, uh, basis of National Cabinet, whether or not those documents had been returned to the, to the COVID committee. And the answer is no, they haven't. I mean, she, I know she's looking at that now, but imagine that. We've had a judicial officer rule that the National Cabinet is not a Cabinet, and yet uh, we still see the government hanging on to that and denying information to Senator, to Senator Gallagher's committee. I mean, that's just extraordinary. All, the, you know, well, it, Senator O'Neill, I actually think you're wrong. It's not a rule unto themselves. It's actually an affront to the rule of law. The separation of powers in our, con under, in our constitution, where we have an executive, and, you know, we have a parliament, we have an executive, and we have a judiciary. And we must respect the boundaries. And for uh, a judicial member to state that it's not a national cabinet, and then to have uh, departments say, well, we're not going to comply with that, it's, it's hugely problematic. Hugely problematic. So uh, I know you're, you're really in support of me, Senator O'Neill, but you haven't, you haven't properly expressed the gravity of this situation. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, it's an affront to the way in which our constitution is set out. So, you know, that that's a problem. And uh, I'm simply asking in my question, what was the cost? What, what was the estimate when you went, when the Commonwealth went into the proceedings? People may not know this, but when you engage a lawyer. Uh, to conduct proceedings on your behalf, you are entitled to get an estimate of the costs. I asked what that estimate was. I asked what the, 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 the real cost is and um, uh, asked to make sure whether, whether or not the answer I was going to get was a final answer. So I moved to the other part of the question which related to the Hawkeye uh, audit. As I said, this is a really strange one. First time ever the, the Attorney General censors an Auditor General's report. Now, the Auditor General, skilled in every audit he does, he considers what he's putting in his reports to make sure they don't uh, include information that damages national security or international relations or any commercial interests. He does that day in and day out. And yet, two years ago, three years ago almost, um, the, uh, uh, in fact it was three years ago, the Auditor General tabled a report um, where he's told to censor some information, because somehow the Attorney General, Mr Porter, knew better. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, J, uh, JCPAA did an inquiry into this, had a look at the whole matter. And that's what spurred me to seek uh, access to that particular document under FOI. And thankfully, uh, it went from 
uh, the department who simply do the tick and flick on this is all this is all confidential to the information commissioner who flicked it onto the AAT straight away because she recognised the complexity of the, the issue. But the matter then was heard by the AAT and, and the AAT uh, found that uh, pretty much all of the redactions that were made by the Attorney General were in fact wrong. They were wrong. They should never have been redacted. Uh, uh, to be accurate, there were a couple of uh, 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 numbers that were redacted, which I agreed might have been sensitive from a commercial perspective uh, and, and did not contest them in, in, the, uh, in the proceedings. Um, one wonders how much that cost. Now, that matter concluded in 2020. So it, it concluded a year ago, and yet there is no answer to this parliament, despite me asking on three occasions what's, what was the cost of that. There's been no answer to this parliament. And I think people are entitled to know, how much does the government spend on, f on falsely defending FOI claims? I'm sure not, I'm not the only one that goes through this. I think the government are entitled to know the, the cost of the Prime Minister's secrecy obsession. Just as we like to know, you know how much uh, you know, drug addiction costs or alcohol addiction costs, I want to understand what the secrecy addiction of the Prime Minister costs the Australian taxpayer. Uh, and, um, and it's troubling that I simply can't get an answer. So whilst this question is more than 30 days old, it's the third time I've asked it. And each time I've asked it, you know, uh, perhaps foolishly, I asked for the total cost, uh, a very sneaky answer is coming back saying, well, we haven't received all the invoices. So I've finally changed the question to say, well, what's the total invoices to date then? And uh, uh, you know, the government's just not ans answering these questions. And they've got to be, they've, they've got to be um, open and transparent to the Australian taxpayer about the costs of these matters, how much they are costing, particularly. You know, I don't know, maybe, maybe this particular a matter was a favour for Talis and, and they've paid him back through some blind trust. I don't know. I take that back. I'm sure Talis didn't do that, but the, the, the proposition lies. I just don't understand why people are trying to hide the value of all of this. And, uh, and I think uh, the, the minister should uh, see why this question Thank hasn't you, been Senator answered. Senator Patrick. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to motions to take note of answers. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Gallagher. Well, again in question time today, we saw how hopelessly divided this government is on the question of action on climate change. Just observing the government during the answers that Senator Mackenzie gave to a series of questions, and then Senator Birmingham as well, it was patently clear the chasm that stands not just between the National Party and the Liberal Party, but within elements of the National Party and elements of the Liberal Party. Now, I notice Senator Scar is sitting there ready to have his turn speaking. And I'm sure that Senator Scar, as someone who would regard himself as a modern Liberal, would be horrified to hear the views of probably the other two Liberals who are in the chamber, let alone Senator Rennick, the one that they all want to disown. Um, and the reaction on the faces from Liberals as they had to listen to Senator Mackenzie bang on and on and ramble all around the countryside about the Nationals' position on net zero emissions in climate change. It's no wonder that so many Liberals regard the National Party as the mad uncle who turns up to Christmas lunch. They are so embarrassed by their National Party coalition partners and the resistance that they have put in place year after year to taking action on climate change and to grabbing the economic opportunities and the jobs that await a country like Australia. Because what has become clear over the last few days and was reinforced in question time today is that the National Party have become the anti-jobs party of Australian politics. 
For years they've been going around crowing and saying how much they care about jobs in regional Australia, ignoring the fact that they have cheered on big mining companies who have casualised their mining workforces, brought labour hire in in droves, undermining wages, undermining working conditions. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume bit your sensitive seat. about casual. Uh, Senator Scar. Order, Deputy President. On uh, many occasions, you have correctly uh, brought me to order in terms of this section of business to make sure that I can confine my remarks to the actual answers to questions that are subject to this section. I note that there was no discussion of casualisation of workforce in the mining industry or some of the other matters that Senator Watt is touching upon. So I'd ask you to bring him to order, please. Thank you, Senator Scar. As you know, this is a broad-ranging debate, and I have been listening carefully. And I will remind Senator Watt to uh, take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to the questions put to him by Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Watt. Please. Thank continue. you, Madam Deputy President. Well, we always are interested to see how sensitive Liberal and National Party senators from Queensland are when their selling out of mining workers through casualisation and labour hire is raised. And here comes Senator Canavan, the biggest sellout of the lot, of the, lot. the man who likes to grade his fancy dress drawer, put on his coal miner's clothes, smear a bit of dust on his face and then come down to Canberra and sell out those very coal miners by backing in the big co mining companies about casualisation and labour hire year after year. Senator Canavan and the National Party are so worried about jobs in regional Queensland that they have assisted the big coal mining companies to casualise their workforce and bring in labour hire year after year and do nothing about it. Now, in answer to Senator Gallagher's question to Senator, Senator Birmingham, that question was all about the cost of the LNP's plan for dealing with climate change. Now, we already know that that cost involves the thousands of jobs which have already been lost across regional Queensland and regional Australia as a result of this government's failure to put forward policies about climate change and renewable energy. We already have seen thousands of jobs that should be going into places across regional Queensland be sent offshore by the National Party uh, because they just can't come to grips with the present, let alone the future. But what we've also learned over the last few days from comments from various National Party members is that that is not the limit of the cost of the LNP's climate change plan. It's not good enough for the LNP to be sending thousands of jobs offshore rather than seeing them grow in regional Queensland and regional Australia. They also want to put in place a $250, sorry, a $250 billion coal fund. I stumbled over the number because the number is so large. They want to give mining companies $250 billion of taxpayers' money to prop them up. These are profit-making companies that they want to give $250 billion worth of taxpayers' funds to. That is $10,000 for every man, woman and child in Australia that they want to hand over to big profit-making mining, uh, profit mining companies. Senator Canavan wants to impose a mortgage tax on every Australian to rather than do something positive about creating jobs through renewables. He's been reported in the media as saying that if we just have to jack up mortgages by a few percentage points, that's not a big price to pay. So he wants every man, woman and child in Australia to pay more for their mortgages. And again, Thank Senator you, Scar Senator is embarrassed by Senator his National Party. Senator Scar. In fact, I, I'm, I'm very enamoured with my National Party colleagues, far from embarrassed. But once again, uh, Madam Deputy President, there was no discussion in terms of mortgage, uh, mortgage tax taxes on mortgages in the, uh, the last uh, uh, question time, and I do ask you to uh, um, bring Senator Watt to order, or uh, certainly the debate will be extremely broad-ranging over the course of the next 45 minutes. Thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, the question was about net zero, and Senator uh, Watt is talking broadly about climate change and net zero, so he is still within the scope of the question. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Again, we know the Liberals are sensitive to the National Party's crazy ideas. And finally, what we've learned in the last couple of days is that the Nationals want to have a $20 billion rort fund. They've already got the spreadsheets drawn up in Senator McKenzie's office. They're ready to go, colour coding it all. It's rorts, it's mortgage taxes, it's coal funds, and it's jobs lost across Queensland. Uh, 
Uh, Senator Canavan, are you seeking a point of order? It, well, I was. Um, it's a little redundant now, but Madam Deputy President, well, then just draw your attention. Resume your seat. I do make a point of order. You, you draw uh, your attention to. Senator I don't know if you were watching Canavan, the... please resume your seat. Thank you. I'm going to give the call to Senator Carr. Sen uh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Scar. Senator Scar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam <coughs> Deputy President. And Senator Watt did indeed. Uh, broadly range over a number of matters during his uh, contribution to the debate, but did um, try and bring them uh, in some way to connect with uh, Senator Gallagher's uh, uh, question of Senator Birmingham. At the outset, can I say there is no greater champion for regional Queensland than Senator Matt Canavan. There is no greater champion for regional Queensland than Senator Canavan. And he is he is recognised in central Queensland by the people who actually live there, by the people who voted at the last federal election, and by the people who voted at the last federal election as a champion for that region, for those businesses and for those jobs. For that region, for those businesses and for those jobs. And that's why he's in the position he's in today. And it gives me um, absolutely no surprise whatsoever that Senator Canavan is advocating for the region and advocating for the livelihoods of those Queenslanders who he stands up for every single day. That's what Senator Canavan does and that's what we expect him to do and that's what the people of Queensland voted him to do and what they will vote for him to do again come the next federal election. I think we've got to look at some facts in terms of this debate around climate change and uh, net zero. Uh, the fact of the matter is that Australia's emissions are at their lowest level since 1990. Emissions in 2020 were more than 20 per cent lower than 2005, which is the benchmark time baseline under the Paris Agreement. Since 2005, Australia has reduced our emissions faster than Canada, Japan, New Zealand and the USA. We are on track to beat our 2030 Paris target of reducing emissions by 26 to 28 per cent, and on a per person basis. That's a reduction of 48 to 49 per cent. And we've done that, we've done that on the basis of a policy which is technology, not taxes. Technology, not taxes. Technology, not taxes. And that is the pathway forward. That's the responsible pathway forward for the Australian government and for the Australian economy. Technology, not taxes. You will not see this government, you will not see this government adopt an overly ambitious, reckless, reckless plan, reckless target, I should say, without a plan for 2030, which will cost jobs in our regions, decimate our regions. You will not see that coming from this side of the chamber. And one of the reasons you won't see that coming from this side of the chamber is because of people like Senator Matt Canavan and because of the National Party representing their constituents in regional Australia. What you will see, what you will see is a reasonable, proportionate response to the realities of the world. That's what you will see, reasonable and proportionate. And there is no doubt that the world is changing in terms of its demand for its energy sources. So it's fit and proper. It is absolutely fit and proper that the government prudently and soberly consider a long-term a long term plan in relation to net emissions. And as part of that plan, as part of that plan, you only have to look at our technology roadmap to see what needs to be part and parcel of it. It includes appropriate investment in terms of industries such as the hydrogen industry, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. We have to work with our trading partners, and there are great Japanese and Korean partners who are engaging today, yesterday, over the last 12 months with great Australian companies in relation to hydrogen investment in this country. And that's the pathway. That's the pathway where we can achieve we can achieve milestones in the longer term in a prudent fashion. And at the same time, at the same time, our coal industry, where we produce some of the best quality thermal coal in the world, will continue to supply coal power plants in our region. At the same time, our gas industry, the Gladstone LNG project and other great gas projects will continue, continue to provide energy sources to the world and continue to do that effectively based on the efforts the enterprise of great Queenslanders and great Queensland companies. We are having a debate on this side of the chamber, and the National Party is an important 
part of that debate, as are all of the views and, and considerations put forward by members of, of the Liberal Party. And they will be considered, be considered soberly, and at the end of that process, we'll have a reasoned, proportionate plan tied to a target. It won't be a, re a reckless, a reckless proposal which will hurt regional Queensland and hurt regional Australia. It will be considered and it will be based on technology, technology advances, not taxes. Technology, not taxes. Thank you, Senator Skye. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And uh, I rise to take note of answers um, of Minister Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Gallagher, who's uh, still here in the chamber. And uh, sometimes my, my breath is just taken away by the crazy statements that I hear coming from those who've been in government for eight years, eight years already, three terms in government, 493 weeks they've had to have the kind of the, the debate that Senator Scars just said, we are having a debate in this House on this side of the chamber. After 493 weeks, 21 energy policies, they're on the cusp of the 22nd and they're still having a debate. That's not leadership. That's a joke. It's a joke. Senator Birmingham, in his defence of this failure in climate policy, has actually commenced his answer here in the chamber this afternoon in response to Senator Gallagher by saying, we will not leave regional and rural communities behind. Well, I've, I've got news for him. He's left them behind. For those 493 weeks, they know they have been left behind and they know that they are being taken for granted by this National Party set of representatives that come to Canberra who are here to look after themselves and have jettisoned the good interests of the people of regional Australia, who are dying at a higher rate than their, uh, their cousins in the city because they have no access to proper GPs or any health care. The regions are well and truly left behind by this government that does not deserve another term. And if there's anything that the last three years of the Morrison government have taught us is the Prime Minister is prepared to spend any amount of taxpayer dollars to keep his spot in the lodge. But he's a miser when it comes to NDIS staffing levels. He's a miser when he refused to reintroduce JobKeeper during the most recent lockdowns when businesses across the great state of New South Wales that I represent were getting absolutely slammed. But when it comes to buying voters or buying the compliance of his coalition partner, Mr Morrison has shown that he's willing to spend as much as $20 billion to try and keep this rabble that considers itself the Australian government loosely cobbled together. $20 billion. That's the reported sum that it's going to cost the taxpayers of Australia in order for the Nationals to stay in the cart with Mr Morrison. Finally, by being bought off despite their continuing ignoring of the science and their failure to, black, to back climate change. This should all have been figured out eight years ago. We've had eight long years of government. And here, at two minutes to midnight, uh, with the horses bolting off to Glasgow, we've got $20 billion of discussion underway because Mr Morrison's found he actually can't work with his coalition partners and he's going to buy them off. And Greece, the election, the re-election of his government by billions and billions of dollars to buy votes. Now farmers throughout New South Wales have struggled through adverse weather, bushfires, tornadoes, droughts, all caused by the rapidly changing climate. The National Party have continued to bury their heads in the sand while farmers and agricultural business owners and investors in that sector in Australia have actually seen what's going on and have tried to get this out of touch National Party rump on board with reality. Senator Mackenzie's in here saying, oh, it's great, we've had a 75 year effective partnership with the Liberal Party. Well, this is not a partnership. It's a debacle. And it's delivered for Australia what Senator Mackenzie described today 
as the poorest people in the country, the most marginalised people, the most vulnerable. 75 years of a supposed partnership, it sounds more like a, a toxic relationship, is not delivering for the people of Australia. And $20 billion of good Australian taxpayer-funded um, money should not be invested in some sort of fanciful way to appease the National Party, who don't even represent the people of the nation who live beyond the Great Dividing Range. They have sold their votes in an easy lie rather than face Thank the hard truth. Senator truths that O'Neill, your time has expired. Just before I call you, Senator Canavan, could all senators please make sure their phones are completely turned off or onto silence? Senator Canavan. Thank you, um, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, well, as a, as a senator in the, from the Nationals Party here today, there's a, there's a lot of people upset with us. Uh, geez, we, we are not flavour of the month down here in Canberra. Uh, today, we get everybody's at us. The, the press are all over us. We're doing all these terrible, evil things. And I suppose my message back to the, the people of, of, of Central and North Queensland is um, that's the way I like it. That's the way I like it. If, uh, if we're doing things that making, are making people down here in Canberra upset, we're probably doing something good for you. Because I tell you what, down here in Canberra, the people down here in Canberra are not on your side. They're not on your side. They're always trying to find ways to kill your job, to take away your industries, uh, to deny opportunities for people in regional Australia. So, so you can take it as a given. You can take it as a given that if people in Canberra are upset with the Nationals Party, the Nationals Party are fighting for you. That's that is the that is the test. That's the test. And I boy, boy, are we meeting that test this week? Everybody is angry with us. Everybody is upset with us. And as I say, that is the way I like it because I don't come to this place to make friends. I don't come down to Canberra, leave my family, have to go back through quarantine now, the way it works. I don't do those things to make friends in Canberra. That's not why I'm here. Other people might be interested in doing that. I don't care. I don't care that the restaurants aren't open or haven't been open here in Canberra because I don't care about making friends. I'm here to fight for people's jobs. I'm here to fight for pe the people's futures. I'm here so that families in central and north Queensland can have a future for their children working and living where they live. I don't want people's kids to have to move to a capital city just to get a job. That's why I fought for the Adani mine. There are 2,000 people working at that mine right now. It's about to export coal into a market, into a market that is absolutely desperate for coal right now. So let's judge people on how good they have been at predicting things the last few years, because we were all told a few years ago that the Adani mine had no commercial case, that it was never going to happen, uh, that it was going to all be robots. Do you remember that, Senator Roberts? Robots. There were going to be robots, or Indians maybe sometimes, uh, working as mine. We'll go out to Carmichael now. When, when has any Labor senator turned up there? Go out and we meet the 2,000 people who have a job thanks to the fight and effort that we put in. And that's what I and many of my Nationals colleagues are continuing to do here. Because we learned today, we learned today that this whole idea that we should sign up to net zero is actually because the US and UK want us to do it. That's, that's apparently why we've got to do it. We didn't get a vote. I mean, I, I was a lot of concerns about the US presidential election last year, but there were apparently there were allegations of dead people voting, other people voting. There were no allegations that Australians voted. I don't think anybody here got a vote. But apparently now, because the US wants us to do it, we've got to do it too. Well, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. But what I do know is that signing up to net zero would be a massive sellout of Australia's interests, a massive sellout of our interests. Because how would we build anything anymore under a net zero target? How are we going to build another Adani mine? Given the demand for coal is through the roof, everybody wants our coal. There is more coal out there in the Galilee Basin. There are another five mines that would employ another 15,000 people if we had the guts to open them up. How are they going to do that if we sign up to net zero target? Because they will. What will happen? We all have seen this before. Senator Ferravanti, Wells, not saying anything about uh, your, 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 your um, heritage here, but you've been here a while. You've been here a while. You know how it works here in Canberra. If we set a net zero target, we will weaponise the bureaucracy here in Canberra who is not on your side. And they will take an inch, take an inch, and run a mile, and anyone who wants to build a mine in this country need not apply because they'll have to offset all their emissions. They'll have to offset them all. What does that mean? They'll have to pay people to plant trees or do other things uh, to, to go back to zero, to get to this net zero. 
Now, when they have to pay that, guess what? That is a tax. That will mean a tax on every mine built in this country. It will mean a tax on every dam built in this country, because farming creates emissions too. It does. There will be, it'll be, a tax. There'll be a tax even on airports. If you want to build an airport in the Great Barrier Reef and open up a new island for tourism, that will attract a tax. Already overseas courts have stopped in the UK have stopped airports because the UK government has signed up to net zero. That has happened. That has happened. And that is about to be our future. Our future is about to be what the UK is getting right now, which is petrol lines, energy shortages. They can't even feed themselves because guess what? Guess what? In the ultimate irony, they don't have enough carbon dioxide. They're running out of carbon dioxide because you need gas to make that and they now get all their gas from Putin who's not giving it to them. This is madness and we should put a stop to it. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, Deputy President. It's always a pleasure to um, uh, proceed uh, to, go, to speak after mortgage tax Matt Canavan and talk about North Queensland and Central Queensland. It's where I have spent the last couple of weeks uh, before coming back to Canberra. I've been in Gladstone, Emerald, Townsville, Mackay, all the way up to Bamaga and Cape York and, of course, uh, in my hometown of Cairns. In Gladstone, they're talking about hydro. They're talking about hydrogen and in Townsville they're talking about the minerals that you need to power renewable energy. Of course in Cairns we already have hydroelectric um, uh, power uh, and renewable energy projects. These people over here don't stand up for the regions. They're not standing up for the national interest. They're not listening to what people are saying in regional Queensland because if they were, they would understand that people in regional Queensland want the job opportunities that will come from making a decision and a plan around net zero. It is the self-interest that drives the National Party. It's the self-interest that drives the Liberal National Party in Queensland. Because we know that the job opportunities that we are losing because this government has failed to back renewables in re regional Queensland are going missing and they're going overseas. Those jobs are going overseas. People in Queensland are missing out on those jobs because this government has failed to deliver a plan and a target for net zero. And we're not talking about hypotheticals here. The government literally vetoed a wind farm in far north Queensland, which cre would create 250 jobs. They stood in the way of 250 jobs because it was against the government's energy policy to create jobs in renewable energy. And we know that the increase in insurance prices, the increase in severe weather events, drought and rising sea levels, that's all going to happen in regional Queensland. It's happening right now. And the impact on the Great Barrier Reef and the jobs that rely on the reef are also in regional Queensland. So when you've got these people over here talking about the fact that they stand up for the regionals, regional areas of our country, what they really mean is they stand up for themselves. They stand up for their own political interests, and we've seen that time and time again. But what we expect from our government is to govern for our whole country, and a pathway to net zero is significant for every Australian, no matter where you live. But the past eight weeks has shown us, that, uh, the past eight years have shown us that in Scott Morrison, we don't have a leader who is willing to fight for this. He's weak and unable to act in the national interest. He's more interested in making hollow announcements than actually delivering when things are tough. And what about the backbone of these so-called moderate liberals who aren't prepared to step up and show any leadership? Where are they on this? Well, I'll tell you where they were about half an hour ago. They were voting with the Nationals against net zero. They've always sat next to them in Parliament. They've always voted with them. They're in government with them. They're in cahoots with them. And they're still so silent on this such important issue. The pantomime of the last few weeks and the last eight years has been about avoiding responsibility and accountability in every corner of this government. You see, it's quite cute, isn't it? The Nats pretend that they aren't even members of the government, so they're not responsible or accountable for the fact that after eight years, Australia has no climate policy. They're in Cabinet. We've got the Deputy Prime Minister 
There's ministers in the National Party, but it's not up to them to govern the country. And then we've got the Liberals on this side who conveniently are able to pretend that they're not responsible for the Nationals. So it's nothing to do with them, that they're not responsible or accountable for the fact that there hasn't been a climate policy for the last eight years. They are in government. The Liberals and the Nationals are in government. The Prime Minister is the leader of the government. But according to him, it's not up to him to lead the country. Minister Angus Taylor said today, the Nationals' interest is aligned with the interests of the Liberal Party, but the problem is that neither is interested in the national interest. After eight long years of this Liberal National Government, we still have no climate policy. And it's clear whatever deal gets cut, whatever $20 billion pork barrel fund gets created, the only way to fix this mess the only way to get action on climate change is to get rid of Scott Morrison and his entire government, the Liberal National Government, at the next election. Thank you, Senator Green. And I do remind you to refer to those in the other place by their correct title. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response to my question uh, to the Foreign Minister. The, the <coughs> UN Climate Summit in Glasgow is coming up in a matter of weeks. Australia is being left behind. I ask the Foreign Minister, why is Australia keeping company with petro-states like Russia when so many other nations have, have agreed to strengthen their 2030 targets. The US, the UK, the EU, Canada, South Africa, Norway, South Korea, Japan, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Kenya, the United Arab Emirates and so many others. And yet this government is allowing um, this pathetic Nationals junior coalition partner to dictate their climate policy. And they're having a squabble about 2050 while the rest of the world is talking about 2030 and while the science is saying we need strong 2030 targets, it is the ultimate coalition response to be talking about something that is irrelevant and 30 years out of date when in fact we need to be talking about strengthening our 2030 targets if we are to avoid climate catastrophe. Uh, now the science says we've got to triple our targets here in Australia to have any hope of meeting that one and a half degree aspiration from the Paris Climate Summit. Now that means we could save what's left of the Great Barrier Reef, we could protect our farmland from worse extreme weather events and more drought, we could protect our people from uh, more severe and more frequent bushfires. But this mob are too in hoc to the big mining and the coal and the gas industries uh, to actually take the science seriously. Now I, I <laughs> asked the uh, minister why, when the International Energy Agency says we can't have a single new coal, oil or gas infrastructure opened if we want to stick with one and a half degrees, why, according to the Department of Industry, is there 72 new major coal projects proposed in Australia and 44 major gas projects planned? in the coming years. How on earth are you going to stick with a net zero target for 2050 with new coal, oil and gas happening? What an absolute farce. They're having this dangerous distraction about 2050 while they use public money to open up more coal, oil and gas, meanwhile ignoring the science on the table that says 2030 is what we need to tackle. We need strong science-based targets. Shame on this government. I cannot wait to see the back of them. Thank you. Senator Waters, so the question is, the motion moved by Senator Waters to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to 